Thanks. So, yeah, I'm Phil. I'm the head of strategy at Fullproof, uh, which is an experience design agency based in London. We've designed things like the interface on the tube ticket machines and EasyJet's booking journey, and obviously lots of things in financial services. And these days, my job is in uh, strategy and, and design programs, um, but my background is in research. So I've probably done between one and 2,000 uh, interviews with customers face-to-face -face in my time at Foolproof. So I spend lots of hours in, uh, in rooms like this. And um, about half of those uh, sessions with customers have been for financial services companies. So we work with everyone from small startups to uh, the biggest of banks. So my perspective on fintech is really from the customer's point of view. I'm interested in what they're doing and what they're thinking and, and why they're doing this. Now, when I talk to uh, people in industry, uh, I hear some skepticism about fintech startups. You know, people say things like, well, isn't this just for early adopters? Or won't the big banks just outmuscle and outspend or just buy up all of these startups? You know, there's a lot of excitement, but is it going to make any difference? And those are good questions, right? And we don't really know the answer until it all plays out. But I think some of the things we've learned from talking to so many customers and designing so much stuff in this space can give us some clues as to how this might play out. So there's three things I want to talk about today. Uh, first of all, an uncomfortable truth about consumer behavior. How the big banks have created an environment in which apathy is the norm and how to design products in this environment and break through to that mainstream. Cool. So first of all, that uncomfortable truth is that people don't switch their bank accounts. Now, bank accounts, current accounts, that's not all of fintech. Obviously, there's, lot, there's lots more to it. Um, but I think it's a really good barometer for progress. You know, there's that statistic about people staying with their bank uh, longer than their husband or wife on average. So I think if we can get people to uh, switch their bank account, we can get them to really do, do anything. So we see these kind of news stories from time to time, current accounts switching at a new low. And when you look into the, the detail around this, the stats really tell a, a really clear story. So there's 52 million adults in the UK, and 97% of them have a current account. Because people have more than one, uh, there are 70 million active personal current accounts out there. Now, the switching service, seven-day switching, 82% of people are aware of it, and 93% of the people who use it find it satisfactory. And of course, we all know there are lots of uh, great incentives, bonuses for switching. So you would expect this to result in lots of people switching their current accounts, but it really doesn't. So Last year, um, less than a million people switching their accounts, only 1.3% of those active ones. Even in the last five years since the current account switching service existed, 4.4 million switches. So I don't know about you, but that's not very good, is it, really? Like, it's not very impressive, that many, that many people switching. So there's only really one conclusion I think we can come to based on these numbers. It's that big banks have not been successful in persuading people to switch. You know, despite all the, the millions of pounds spent, all the countless hours spent, all this effort just hasn't really made a difference. And so when people are skeptical about you know, a, a fintech with a few dozen or a few hundred people coming along, like, how, how is that going to change anything? But thankfully, um, just because people don't switch doesn't mean they won't switch. And the reason I say this is that as designers, we know that people's behavior and how they you know, behave in the marketplace is shaped by the environment they find themselves in. The best place if you want to see this, is somewhere that's familiar, I'm sure, to all of us. Uh, it's everyone's favorite furniture store, IKEA. Now, if you go to IKEA and you, say, go, on there, go there on the weekend and you're just there to watch people and see what they're doing, 
um, you can see the behavior. So upstairs in IKEA, you watch people and they're just kind of meandering around and they're not really focused and they're not buying anything and they're not really kind of in the mood to, to kind of transact at that point. And then when you go to uh, downstairs in IKEA, people are very focused, they're in a hurry, they're not interested in discovering any new products. Of course, we know why this is, right? We know how IKEA works. Um, but it just goes to show, I think, how people's behavior can be so different depending on the environment they're in. So when it comes to the environment people have in financial services with the big banks, what do people think about this environment? Well, in all the research we do, uh, people say the same thing over and over again. And it's banks are all the same. Right? They are super apathetic to banks. They don't really care. They don't want to have a relationship with a the bank. They just kind of use them and you know, it's because they have to, right? Because they get their salary paid in. They're not really interested in, in kind of engaging any, any further than that. And you know, I don't think it's because people are ignorant of the differences that there are. I think it's because um, you know, they're basically right. It is the same. It does feel the same when you're using the experience from any of these different banks. And the reason this is the case is because these banks have been promising one thing and then delivering a different thing for many years. And this isn't just, you know, all the kind of bad press PPI stuff. It's that when you look at what banks say about themselves, what they promise through their advertising, and then you look at the actual experience, um, there's such a massive gap between these two things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on a few banks, and I hope you don't work there. Um, I could have really picked like any, any bank, but let's start with Santander. So Santander is about here to help you prosper. They love their celebrity endorsements. And then when you use the app, like does this really come through? Like can you tell how they're helping you prosper in here? Like, you know, maybe the, the one, two, three savings perhaps, but it's, I don't think it's really that clear. Uh, Barclays. Let's go forward, life skills, digital skills. But the app looks really similar to Santander's app. I mean, it's not really that different. Even Metro Bank, right, join the revolution, um, you know, banking, but better, bringing personal service back to banking. Wow, like, oh, but look, the app is kind of similar to, to what Santander's and Barclays app, app is like. And all the banks are like this, whether it's about being there for every step of the way, or bringing local banking back to Britain, or unexpected bank, or giving you extra, like the experience is essentially the same, regardless of what they are saying about themselves. Even some of the advertising is the same. So these are pages about the mobile banking apps. What is it about like children in capes? Now surely, surely, if you're gonna have your banking app, like, and, it, and it's a great banking app, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you show it? So anyway, that's a, a side note. Um, so what we, what we call this when there's this massive difference between what they're saying about themselves and what they're doing is this brand experience gap. Now, um, this is really kind of highlighting the difference and the importance of the link between what people expect from what you're telling them and what actually happens. There's this example we use at work a lot. Um, imagine we are selling some burgers. If we promise you this is what the burger's gonna be like, but you actually get this burger, then of course what people think about you and your brand and your company is this, right? You're only as good as the experience that you get. And any marketing, advertising, is only as valuable as what people think about you, which is, of course, what the experience is like. So when people are saying all banks are the same, what they mean is like, this is the, the banking industry as they see it. It's all kind of similar, and none of it is particularly inspiring, right? So the good news for uh, fintech startups is that if you come along 
and you're doing something that's really close to what you're promising, you know, this is how it looks, right? It's completely different. You stand out a mile. I've, I've picked Monzo because they've got a nice little character I can put on my slide, but um, you, know, you can substitute a lot of these, a lot of the startups in here, and there's, there's some argument to say, well, you know, there's some features they've got, but now my Barclays app has got freeze my card, and oh, it's coming to this bank and that bank. But I don't think it's just about features. There's so much more to this. It's about these companies being different to what has come before. And having a, a company that you have some relationship with that is actually doing what they say they are, they're going to do. So this make me, makes me really hopeful about, about fintech and, and the prospects of the whole, the whole industry. So if this is the environment we are designing in, um, then, then yeah, how do, we, how do we design for that consumer behavior? Five different ways. The first one, of course, my background being in research is about research. So use research to discover what to do, not just to check your work. So when you test your work, you do, say, user research in every single sprint that you're doing. That's great, right? You, you check all of your assumptions, and you stop yourself making terrible, terrible design decisions. But everyone is doing this these days. People are always surprised uh, just how systematic user research is in the big banks. Like, these banks take it very seriously. Everything has to be tested before it goes live. So if you're thinking, well, we, we've got user research and we're testing all our designs, like, that's just table stakes, you know? That's what everyone else is doing. So it's not really an advantage to involve customers in the design process because, you know, it's 2018. Everyone has kind of realized this by now. But research is useful for so much more than just checking your work, right? If you go out and learn about people and you truly understand their lives and how they think about money. Um, there's so much more you can get from the kind of, you know, so much more inspiration you can get for the design process than just, you know, what, what silly mistakes have I made? You can really kind of uncover all the unmet needs that perhaps your competitors haven't, um, haven't touched. So you could do, I mean, there are whole conferences on design research methods, but essentially go out into the world, talk to people, learn about their habits and their lives. One thing I would definitely recommend is take designers with you. Don't just send a researcher on their own and then you know, come back and translate the findings. Especially if, especially if you're a small company, just send the designers with the researcher to go do that research. You're not going to lose anything in translation and it really kind of helps for the whole team to empathize um, with those people. Uh, and then you come back and you put everything on to post-it notes as you do. Um, and, you know, away you go from there. But, so I suppose that the main point here is about, about empathizing with your users and using that research to uh, inspire the design process, not just to check your homework. So one of the things that you learn when you go and do this research is that it's an emotional and not a rational decision to buy or switch. Now, earlier I said that your behavior is um, kind of based on your environment. So this applies to us as well. Now, if you're in a company where you're making evidence-based decisions and you're looking at dashboards and running experiments and doing A-B testing and all this kind of stuff, you can end up thinking in this very, very rational way, right? If you're making a business case to the board and you're looking at the KPIs, you think in this very rational way, and you can fall into the trap where you think customers think in this rational way, and then you kind of present your product information in these kind of you know, bullet points, bullet points, bullet points, make the case, they'll get it, and I'll understand it, and they'll, they'll switch, right? That's how it works. But of course, this isn't how people really think and make decisions. It's much more of an emotional decision. So let's just take one example of cars. There is no rational reason why someone would spend tens of thousands of pounds on a car that goes much faster than the speed limit. Right? It just doesn't make any sense. 
If you ask someone who's got an expensive car, I'm sure they can give you reasons like the safety and the, oh, the engine's great and it's really reliable and all these kind of things. But we all know it's more about what does it feel like to drive and what does it mean to be a person who drives a BMW and does it feel like I've achieved something in life if I'm driving this type of car? These kinds of things, right? It's, a, it's an emotional decision. Now, when we're making um, design decisions with this in mind, there's this model that we find really useful called the Four Forces model. And I just wanted to share it because it's not that well known. It's, it's related to jobs to be done, which I'm sure you've we heard of. But this one, I think, kind of applies to almost every client we come across. So I kind of spent a few minutes uh, walking through an example. Let's imagine that we're selling uh, stocks and shares ISAs. Now, on the right-hand side, the new behavior we want to encourage is that the person has got our product and they're investing their money uh, in stocks and shares ISAs. And the existing behavior they would have would be that they're, say, using a cash ISA. So we want to get them from the left to the right. And uh, there are two forces pushing them across and en encouraging them. The first one is the push of the situation. So this is about they realize they have a problem in their life that they want to solve. So if the person doesn't know about inflation and doesn't know about compound interest and doesn't know that their money's being eaten away, there's not much of a force there. Whereas if they know this stuff, like they have a big incentive to do something. The pull of the new situation, so how attractive is that new choice? So if your friend told you about that year when you got 20% return on your investments, like that's a really attractive thing. But if you have no idea about that, is there any reason to be interested in investments? You know, it, it doesn't matter all the, if all the features of your stocks and shares ISA are great. If they have no interest, no, no kind of attractive force um, getting them to, to investigate it, then they're not going to going to kind of convert. And then especially with um, financial services, there's a lot of things which keep, people can be uncertain about, which creates a lot of anxiety. So often when we're doing research, like one of the main things we see is lots and lots of anxiety around things that they're just not sure about. And finally, the last blocker is the habits, the kind of inertia people have. So if you've been saving using cash your entire life, like there's a big force that's stopping you from progressing. So I think using this model can be really helpful in understanding like how people really think about this problem, not just let's just kind of go for a super rational and, and list all the features. Oh. Okay. Um, one of the things that that model uh, shows is that you need to communicate the difference between what people's live life is like now and then how your product is going to fill some kind of gap in that. So having a really clear contrast in your, your kind of advertising or your marketing is, is really essential. So Basecamp um, is a really great example of this. So in their marketing, that their whole website, everything is, is framed in this way. So they illustrate all the pain you're going to have with all these notifications and phone calls and meetings and all this kind of stuff. And then when they talk about the uh, product, they're wording it in such a way that it explains like how is it different. So everything's going to be in one place. Everyone's on the same page. Um, you know, you'll free up time spent on meetings. Even when they show the product, they are showing like, okay, forget micromanaging. You've now got this thing and this replaces status meetings. It's all about showing the difference between your current situation and what that new, that new life will be like with Basecamp. There's an example um, that I'll revisit to show for FinTech. And I think when Monzo first came out, one of the reasons why they got so much excitement and interest is because it was super, super clear what the contrast was that they were kind of promising. So finally, a bank as smart as your phone this is just really, really concise. So anyone who is a kind of early adopter who realizes that, yeah, your banking app isn't very good, and compared to the other apps on my phone, 
doesn't seem to get updated or just isn't very good. This is just very, very um, kind of clear. You can instantly understand, like, okay, I get what Monzo is about, I get what the promise is, and I don't need to kind of see the app or investigate anymore. I can just understand what they're about. So this, I think, is a, is a really good example of that. Once you've got a proposition that works, then one thing we would suggest doing is having a vision for what the experience will be like in the future, and then using that to, to kind of work backwards to figure out what you should do. Now, one of the reasons why all those uh, banking apps I showed earlier don't match up to what the advertising is isn't just that you know one agency does the ads and then no one talks to the people who are uh, building it. It's because people often don't know how to translate the brand and the vision and strategy into actual design work, right? If, if, if I meant to make an app that brings local banking back to Britain, like what, what does that mean exactly? Like we said that in the statement in the annual report, but how do we do that in the app? It's not always particularly obvious. And if you are not sure how that's going to manifest itself, then you're probably just going to ignore it and you'll do what you think is best practice and then all the apps end up you know, being the same. So what, what we need to do is find a way to bring that strategy to life. And the important thing is that everyone in the whole company, regardless of their position, just understands exactly what that is. And the best way to do this, I think, is to imagine that future and then work back from it. There's this really good example from Airbnb. It's, um, it's discussed in this podcast, which we've got the link to here. It takes like you know, 30 or 40 minutes, but I'll, I'll do a really quick version. Essentially, one of the things Airbnb did is they, um, they got this guy who lived in London to come to San Francisco on a holiday, and they said, can we just take photos of your holiday and just observe you and, and follow you around? And what they saw is that you know, he went to Alcatraz on his own, and he went to the Golden Gate Bridge on his own, and he sat at restaurants on his own, he went to bars on his own, and it was kind of like a bit of a rubbish holiday. You know, he's ticked the boxes, but it wasn't very memorable. Then what they did is they said, OK, come back, and this time we are going to organize your holiday. Right? So they pick him up at the airport, and they get him the best Airbnb, and they take him to dinner parties, and he goes on a magical you know, bike ride at night, and all this kind of stuff. And this guy is like overwhelmed, like best holiday he's ever had, super meaningful. It's amazing, right? And so this little kind of experimental story, it gives Airbnb utter clarity of what their purpose is. You know, what they want to do is create experiences like that, and they know they can do this for one person, so what they have to do as a company is, how do we do this but for 100 million people? Like, how do we scale up this experience? And this little story you can tell in two minutes, everyone in the whole of Airbnb can understand that. And in so many companies, if you ask people who work there, what is the purpose of so-and-so bank? What will, what will it be like in three years' time? What are you aiming for? No one has any idea, right? Whereas once you have this, you can get um, really, you can get there really quickly. So Airbnb, of course, they've launched this Airbnb experiences. Once you understand that story and where they're trying to get, this is exactly what it is, right? This is scaling up these kind of memories and moments so that everyone can have them. So yeah, I'm not suggesting you fly people from different places, but finding some way to articulate what that future customer experience is like, even if you can't get there soon, is just super valuable. And uh, lastly, when you're actually executing on stuff, it sounds really obvious, but focus on the small details, because like we were showing earlier with those burgers, you're only as good as, as the worst part of the experience. So there's one startup you might have heard of called Bulb, and they do a great job of the details. So when you're switching your energy supplier, there's a period of time where nothing happens, and so they send you an email saying, it's all going really well. Like, don't worry, you know, 
it's, it's all okay. And then when you are uh, doing a meter reading, it's kind of a pain to you know, put your phone there and take a you know, reading. So you can just hold your phone up and it will just automatically you know, get the numbers. And even when you're um, you know, going through the journey, just adding or subtracting a, a bedroom, you know, it just changes this, this little icon. And these kind of things, when you have them throughout the whole process, make such a big difference. And these are the kind of things that bigger companies generally can't be bothered with, or they seem too trivial, or they get deprioritized. And so you never see this kind of stuff in, in you know, big banks' apps, for example. So these kind of things can make a big difference. So yeah, that's, that's the brand experience gap, and five ways to uh, break through to the mainstream. So yeah, use design research to uh, inspire what you're doing. Um, it's an emotional decision to buy. Start with a really clear brand promise where there's contrast. Create a vision for that future experience, and then uh, remember to focus on the small stuff. And that's it. Thank you.